I am inspired by this movement. It's wonderful to be here. This is the first of these that I've been to. I was supposed to come last year, and I had to uh, bug out for some reason I don't recall, probably insufficient. But uh, I'm very glad to be here. And, and what Rob said is true. I, I was uh, it's so inspired by Susan's uh, talk and by our conversation over dinner that I uh, completely revamped my talk. So what you may uh, find is that I'm <laughs> flustering around looking for, where's that page that I... Uh, that I put out of place, but um, uh, I think yeah, I think it's really important to kind of build on and springboard off of some of the things she said. Uh, and, uh, and and incidentally, she's someone whom I have admired from afar for many years. My wife and I homeschooled our children, and so uh, uh, we we were well aware of her work and made use of it. Uh, so uh, uh, that's yet another reason I'm happy to be here. But what I, I think uh, the, the talk that she gave was very interesting in kind of uh, um, opening the hood, so to speak, and uh, looking at the way historians go about what they do and fallacies to which we're prone, which is always important to, to remember uh, and keep in mind. Uh, and I wanted to just build on that um, and talk a little bit at first. I am going to talk about Land of Hope eventually if, if, it doesn't, if I don't run out of time. Um, but um, I want to talk at first about history as a way of knowing. History as a, not just a form of knowledge, not just a body of knowledge, but a way of knowing that, that is distinct and distinctive and, and, uh, and in that sense is all representative of, of the distinctive way of knowing that the humanities offer. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I want to begin thinking about um, yeah, muses. <laughs> we were Cleo, or Clio as some people say, uh, uh, was invoked repeatedly in the promotional materials. I don't know how often she's been invoked since then. Uh, but, um, you know, and of course epics begin with the evocation of the muse, a request for the inspiration of the muse. Menina, aide thea, thea, in the Iliad. Um, even uh, John Milton does it in a sort of uh, uh, a way. He's really clearly, clearly talking about the Holy Spirit, but he says, heavenly goddess at the beginning of Paradise Lost. So that this is a, a, a tradition of, of the epic form. Uh, You'd have to look very hard to find anything that invokes Cleo at the outset. Uh, Herodotus does not do that. I actually looked it up uh, just to be sure. Um, he says, this is the display of the inquiry of Her Herodotus of Halicarnassus, so that things done by man not be forgotten in time, and that great and marvelous deeds, some displayed by the Hellens, some by the barbarians, not lose their glory, uh, and so on. So <clears throat> there's no um, sing goddess, <laughs> fill me up, uh, uh, on, on the contrary. Cleo doesn't sing much. She's got a very, you know, she doesn't have perfect pitch, let's put it that way. So, um, and, and um, in that sense, she's not a very useful goddess, even though she's the goddess uh, that we got for this, uh, this occasion. Um, history is is the work of the imagination, but it's the work of, and I borrow a term from Cushing Stroud, uh, a American studies scholar of a different generation, uh, the voracious imagination, not voracious, voracious, that is the truthful imagination, the imagination that, that, is, uh, that puts together the factual record in a faithful but also uh, creative way. There is a lot of creativity, as Susan brought out, in the fashioning of historical narratives or, 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 or um, trains of logic. Uh, they don't automatically uh, assemble themselves. We have, to, we have to do it. We have to do that work. And, and there's a lot of similarity. I don't want to take this too far, but there is a lot of similarity with fiction. Fiction has to have verisimilitude also to be uh, persuasive, at least uh, uh, the, the standard 19th century novel, uh, uh, maybe the, from the 20th century on, that's all gone to hell, but uh, <laughs> fiction, good fiction should have a believability about it. Um, 
um, except for a few genres like fantasy, perhaps science fiction. Uh, science fiction, you know, all, the aliens always, if they're advanced aliens, they always have British accents, which I sort of like. <laughs> Very refined, you know. <laughs> they're either or a British accent. There's not a whole lot in between. Um, what about the idea, again, that, that Susan brought up, of history as science? I think she quite properly uh, dismissed it, and uh, I, I would do the same, a little more, with a few more pummelings. Uh, uh, I think are caref it's, it's, it's important to be um, careful about that, but um, because th there's much about the, the methods of science, the care of science, the weighing of evidence, the attempt to disaggregate uh, variables, that's the essence of an effective scientific experiment. There's much in that way of thinking that people who practice uh, history, uh, historical inquiry, ought to, to imitate. But the scientific method itself is impossible to pursue. Why? Because history is, and this is my, one of my epigraphs for the day, history is the science of incommensurable things and unrepeatable events. Let me repeat that. Uh, history is the science of incom uh, incommensurable things and unrepeatable events, which means that it is no science at all, uh, because science depends on precisely that, that element, those elements of commensurability and replication to do its work. Um, so none of the human sciences, as they're called, particularly in Europe, uh, can be uh, sciences <laughs> because, uh, for a number of reasons, partly because of the inherent dignity of the subject. We, we can't violate, or we shouldn't, violate that dignity for the sake of experimentation. Uh, we don't murder to dissect, at least if we're civilized people. Um, and partly because, and related the, 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 to this, but the subject of inquiry, uh, unlike uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the physics of Galileo, uh, the, the subject has a consciousness. The subject has an ability to act, to deliberate, to respond, uh, to change, to respond to interpretations that are propounded of its uh, behavior. So. Um, uh, it's really studying an entirely different sort of, of cat. Um, you can simultaneously drop a corpse and uh, a, a sack of potatoes off of the Tower of Pisa. They'll let you get up there with the potatoes. <laughs> and, uh, and together, if you drop them simultaneously, they will illustrate, as Galileo illustrated, a precise law of motion, of science. But this experiment will not tell you very much about the spirit that animated that plummeting corpse, uh, its consciousness, its achievements, its failures, its dreams, its progeny, its loves and hates, its anxieties, its hopes and aspirations its moments of glad grace and transcendence. Physics will tell you nothing about who that person was. All that it will tell you about is mass and acceleration. Uh, by such a calculus, our bodies may indeed become indistinguishable from sacks of potatoes. But thankfully, that's not the calculus of history, uh, a reason why history is not a science. Uh, so. Uh, false precision is an enemy of good history. If you try too hard to reduce everything to quantitative factors that are all on a commensurable scale, you're likely to get precision rather than accuracy. And that's an important distinction between those two words. We often confuse them. Pre precision uh, using inadequate indices is not going to give you an accurate account of things. It's going to give you a precise one of something unrelated to the thing that you want to describe. So it's important to uh, render the truth of things with the tools and vocabulary that are appropriate to its nature. Uh, you can't measure love 
or courage with a set of calipers. Uh, history, as Susan repeated several times, is about time. It's about us as creatures in time. Thoreau uh, has said, uh, time is the stream I go a fishing in. And that's also true of historians. Uh, we, we go a fishing in that same stream. Uh, history as a study, as a form of knowledge, reminds us that our origins live on in us. It reminds us that we can never entirely remove the incidentals of our time and place because they never are entirely incidental. At the same time, it reminds us this has always been true for all men and women of all times. In other words, it reminds us that historicity is part of the human condition. Therefore, appreciation of the past can't be reached by mere introspection, by thinking about it a lot. Uh, although it probably can't be re reached without some measure of it, some self-knowledge that comes from that. C.S. Lewis, uh, who's been quoted here a few times, uh, and was, I think, not a relativist, uh, we could all agree, nevertheless a warned against universalizing oversimplifications of what he called the doctrine of the unchanging human heart. Now, this is a fundamentally historical insight. This, this uh, uh, posits that the things that separate one age from another are superficial. Let me just read a quote from Lewis. This comes from his uh, preface to Paradise Lost. Just as if we strip the armor off a medieval knight or the lace of a Caroline courtier, we should find beneath them an anatomy identical with our own, so it is held. If we strip off from Virgil his Roman imperialism, from Sidney his code of honor, from Lucretius his Epicurean philosophy, and from all who have it, their religion, we shall find the unchanging human heart, which he capitalizes, the unchanging human heart. And on this we are to concentrate. Well, he's utterly disdainful of this idea, which is none of which is to say that these authors are reducible to their attributes, to their context, uh, which is a fallacy to which historians are prone. Uh, so that Virgil becomes nothing but Roman imperialism, um, as the flat-footed historicists uh, might well contend. Nor does it mean that great literature, which has the power to touch chords of sympathy, a sense of universal humanity, uh, a position for which Lewis would certainly be a spokesman, uh, is, is any less powerful. It is, however, to point out that such universals as we are available to us to use uh, can be apprehended only through careful attention to particulars. They can't be reduced to mere inert propositions. Like everything, generalizations must be hard won. And this is one of the things that historians insist upon. And even if they did find a way to codify them neatly, they would not stay that way for long. We never finally can reduce what we know about ourselves to a set of inert propositions because whatever we know about ourselves or think we know becomes a part of who we are the moment we know it. At the very moment we absorb such propositions, we inch beyond their grip. Self-knowledge is, in that sense, constant transformation. Writing history is even more so because it means taking ever-moving aim at an ever-moving target with ever-changing eyes, transforming weapons, and protean intentions. History, wrote uh, John Lukács, the Hungarian-American historian, history by its very nature is revisionist because it is the frequent and constant rethinking of the past an enterprise that, unlike a court of law, tries its subjects through multiple jeopardy. You're never out of the woods with history. <laughs> the past changes, not only because it's constantly growing, but because the things we need from it change too. And it will always be true because the writing of history is always taking its bearings from the needs of the present. How could it be otherwise when you think about it? 
So long as history is still a vital intellectual undertaking, indispensable to our civilized condition, it will always be proper and necessary for us to seek out precedents in the past and to do so energetically without being content to confine the past to a comfortable imprisonment in its own context. Nothing really has changed since Thucydides penned the history of the Peloponnesian War. I mean, some things have changed, but <laughs> it, the, nothing uh, with regard to historiography, the fundamental um, its condition, situation of it. Um, and the, Thucydides said that his work was sustained by the fragile hope that it would be consulted by those who desire an exact knowledge of the past as a key to the future, which in all probability will repeat or resemble the past. Well, we, you know, we get a history repeating itself here, or the, the, the speculation that that might be so. What certainly is true is that the past very few precedents are the only information that we really have about the likely outcomes for similar endeavors in the present and the future. Elusive as it is, the past is all we really know, all we have to work with. Cleo doesn't really have a laboratory, but if she did, we'd have to call it a very makeshift one. Uh, <laughs> but it has to be if it is to remain true to the things that it studies, the truths that it attempts to ascertain. So history, am I doing something here? History is a laboratory of sorts. And by the standards of science, it's a really lousy laboratory. Uh, uh, but it's all we have to work with. Uh, it's the only laboratory available to us to assay the possibilities of our human nature uh, in a manner that's consistent with that nature. Uh, we can't design replicable experiments and still claim to be doing uh, science, uh, if, even in the absence of those things, and claim to be studying human beings rather than descending corpses, as in my earlier example. Uh, Chief among the things that history should teach us, especially those of us who live in the comfortable bosom of a prosperous country, a prosperous America, is what Henry James called the imagination of disaster. The study of history can be sobering and shocking and morally troubling. It should be. One doesn't have to believe in original sin to study it successfully, but it helps by relentlessly placing on display the pervasive crookedness of the timber of humanity. History brings us back to earth, equips us to resist the powerful lure of radical expectations, and reminds us of the grimmer possibilities of human nature, possibilities that for most people living in most times have not been the least bit imaginary. So we work away in Clio's makeshift laboratory deducing what we can from the patient examination of singular examples. Remember, incommensurables, <laughs> unrepeatables. Uh, it's a crazy way to go about things. The best analogy I can think of to science is it's like we were using deductions from a mad scientist's notebook uh, who conducted half haphazard experiments once only. Uh, and uh, recorded in detail the, the, uh, the results of them, but never repeated them. Uh, but again, this is, this is how the form of knowledge that we're talking about, history, is different, uh, and how the humanities, more generally, are different, uh, among whose number I think history should be included. Um, it is... Um, some would argue that history is valuable to us, and this is beginning to modulate toward my book. So, <laughs> Some would argue that history is useful to us mainly for disabusing us of false notions of the past. It's not for telling us about the things that made us, 
but for telling us, uh, giving us a way to release ourselves from the power of the things that made us and thereby confer upon us the possibility of boundless um, exercise of our, of our gifts, our potentialities. If everything is constructed, everything can be dismantled uh, and reconstructed in a manner more after our own hearts. So principle, the history's principal value in this understanding is not as a glue, something holding us together, but as a solvent, something releasing us. I think there's truth in this, and I think Susan made some points about this, and there certainly are all kinds of things, the, the lost cause of the South, any number of things in American history that we're the debunking and critical exercise of historical intellect has been, has been absolutely necessary. But, but the study of history, and this is what I worry about, having been lost, the study of history ought to be directed not only at the accumulation of knowledge and the overturning of myths and legends, but also at the cultivation of a historical consciousness, which means that history is also an avenue whereby the present can escape not only from the past, but from the present. It's a way the present and, and, uh, is, is uh, there's a sense in which the present imprisons us. All the, what Susan had to say about fake news is an example of the imprisonment of the present, the way that a historical perspective can take us out of that. Um, Historical study ought to enlarge us, ought to deepen us, draw us out of ourselves by bringing us into serious encounter, again, Susan said some of this, with strangeness and the strange familiarity of a past, a past that's already a part of us, if we're talking about American history, and indeed the whole history of the West. Um, so historical consciousness, to put it in a very simple way, uh, is, is the ability to see the past inherent in the present. It's actually a kind of vision, a kind of supreme achievement of consciousness. And uh, I, I, my own life, I think of uh, several places where I've felt this most vividly in, in Rome. I mean, you'd have to be adult not to uh, <laughs> have a sense of the imminence of the past and the present there. But in America, too, in places like Antietam, Battlefield, uh, the the uh, um, Jamestown, very striking place because the tininess of Jamestown gives you a sense of what um, <laughs> of how tiny were the beginnings of this great nation, uh, you know, uh, and uh, and I thought too of a, a you know a, a wonderful passage. This is an example, I think, of a kind of historical consciousness. You all remember the very end of. F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby, and uh, this passage is the next to last paragraph at the end of the book. Uh, Most of the big shore places were closed now, and there were hardly any lights except the shadowy, moving glow of a ferry boat across the Sound, Long Island Sound. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes. A fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams for a transitory moment, enchanted moment, Man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled to an aesthetic contemplation that he neither understood nor desired, face to face with the for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. Uh, I would, uh, there's a kind of historical consciousness operating there, the Dutch sailor's eyes, to, to enter into that moment, to what they must have saw, to what they must have experienced. Um, so in drawing us out of ourselves, of our puny individual consciousness, whoever we are, uh, history cultures us, 
in an active sense of that word, multiple senses of that word. And as such, it is, to use a word that Rob has been using, it is a discipline formative of the soul. It shapes the soul. So the historians, I don't know how well this will play with your local school boards and such, but uh, I don't think historians should be at all apologetic uh, about what they do, uh, I, that we fulfill an important public purpose when we do our jobs right. We don't always do our jobs right, but we fulfill an important public purpose simply by doing our jobs right. We don't need to justify ourselves in terms of practical considerations. We do our part when we preserve and advance a certain kind of consciousness and memory, traits of character on which a culture of relentless change, endless er instant erasure, fake news, <laughs> etc., has all but declared war. Human beings are by nature remembering creatures, story-making creatures, uh, whether it's a neurological fluke or not, I don't know. Um, History embraces and affirms these traits, even as it insists on refining them by the light of truth. Uh, and just a few final words and then on to land of hope. Uh, I did want to, that word truth, I think, is very important, that we not be agnostic about the, the, the possibility of, of truth in history. Thucydides certainly believed it. It was possible to find the truth. Uh, and. What I would say about that is that truth is always, it's always important to, uh, you'll see with Land of Hope, I wanted to be both inspiring and truthful in the, in the account of the American past that I give. But truth is very important. Truth is the basis of our common world. If we cannot argue constructively about historical truth and untruth, and cannot thereby open ourselves to the possibility of persuasion, then there's no reason for us even to talk about the past. If we cannot believe in the reasonable fixity of words and texts, there's no reason for us to write. If we cannot believe that an author has something to offer us beyond the mere fact of his or her situatedness, uh, identity would be uh, another word, uh, then there's no reason for us to read. If we cannot believe there's more to an author or a book than political or ideological commitments, there's no reason for us to listen. If history ever ceases to be the pursuit of truth, it will be nothing more than the self-regarding sentimentalism that eventuates in the will to power, the war of all against all. Well, and, and of course I wrote Land of Hope to avert all of that. <laughs> uh, 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 let me move now to talking about that uh, because that, that kind of view of history is one of the things, is, is one of the, is the background behind this somewhat unusual textbook. So why did I write it? Uh, there were times when I was working on it when I wondered myself. In fact, I, I really didn't want to do it. Uh, I saw the need, I felt strongly the need, but every time uh, that a, a publisher would suggest it to me, I would say, you know, I absolutely, agree, and I hope you find somebody to do it. <laughs> um, but uh, I did think, after all the years that I've been, uh, these many years I've been an academic, uh, uh, that um, after all the years of complaining about the way that we professional historians have fragmented and uh, uh, dissolved the, the main story of American history into a thousand subcategories and parts, it seemed to me that at a certain point you have to stop complaining and either shut up or do something. So I finally decided to do the latter uh, and, and, and try to do something. <clears throat> what I wanted to write was a textbook that was compact, relatively compact. It's not as compact as I wanted, but you know, it, it was hard enough to make it as compact as I did. Um, inexpensive, it is that compared to the competition. Um, accurate, authoritative, and readable. The, the current textbooks are really very hard to read. I find them very hard to read. I don't, I, I don't know what your students do, but uh, this is a readable book. Uh, and it's truthful and inspiring. Uh, it sh it's meant to shapen 
uh, and deepen, to shape and deepen, their sense, students' sense of the land they inhabit, making them understand the land's roots, equipping them for the privileges and responsibilities of citizenship, and a sense, as, which is part of citizenship, I think, a sense of membership in this great enterprise, this country, the most exciting, perilous, and consequential story they're likely ever to encounter. And I, I want to emphasize the citizenship angle on this. I really thought of this uh, in, in a way that those of us who are university professors, I, I don't think should be required to, uh, I wouldn't get anywhere if I thought they should, uh, to think in terms of what the effect of our work is on civic sensibilities, on the ability of young people to sort of understand and appropriate a knowledge of their institutions. That really should happen in, in uh, secondary school. I, and, and, and that's really where I designed this book to go, to that kind of audience. Um, the existing textbooks, I won't spend too much time beating up on them, but they, I think they all have the, the problem. Uh, and it's somewhat intrinsic to the, the whole business of making textbooks in this day and age. They, they present a fragmented, fractured, segmented, um, discontinuous account of American society. And it fails to convey to young people the, a sense of the larger arc of that history. What my fear is, is that we're losing a sense, a general grasp in this country, uh, among the young, of the, the public meaning of our own history. Uh, professional historiography has made enormous strides that I am proud of uh, in the breadth and sophistication which it brings, particularly to the understanding of marginalized and uh, inarticulate uh, classes and, uh, and peoples of the past. Uh, but this does not have to come, as it unfortunately has, at the expense of a broadly shared public knowledge and shared historical consciousness in the populace. Um, my fear is that the story of America has been so burdened with ideological and other baggage that the study of history may actually alienate young Americans from the possibility of appreciating their own past and making it their own, which is a kind of denial of their birthright, of the, the, the essential components of a vibrant and full sense of citizenship, of participation and membership in this great story. And this is a state of affairs that just can't continue without producing serious consequences. A great nation, or even just a cohesive nation, needs a cohesive narrative and needs to convey that narrative to the rising generations effectively if it is to perpetuate itself and sustain its aspirations in the face of the challenges thrown up by the present and the future. It goes without saying that it cannot be a fairy tale version of the past. It will not be convincing if it's not truthful. But there's no necessary contradiction between a truthful account and an aspiring one. And we have ceased to provide either one consistently in our educational system. So this combination of truthfulness and inspiration, or maybe hopefulness, uh, is exactly what I've attempted with Land of Hope. Um, let me, I want to read you a few things. How, how am I doing on time? Okay, yeah. Okay, well, th does that mean I can just, huh? Oh, wow. Well, I could read my autobiography. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will, I will, I will. Um, I want to read to you first uh, a few, few segments from the book. Um, I want to read to you first uh, the epigraph, which is usually, and this will take a while, this is not one of those, you know, uh, one sentence epigraphs. Uh, takes up the whole page. <laughs> and, uh, but it's a terrific epigraph, and I actually had it pinned to my computer monitor the whole time I was writing the book uh, to remind me of what I was doing. Um, it's from John Dos Passos, the the great American novelist, great experimental novelist who uh, was a radical in his early years uh, and then uh, uh, moved 
to the right, uh, and, and by, the, by the 1950s was, and, and before that, he really uh, was writing. He became very interested in the American past and the, in studying the American past, studying the life of Jefferson and others. It's a sort of resource to draw upon. Um, and you'll see that in this passage, which I take from an essay he wrote uh, called The Use of the Past. <clears throat> Every generation rewrites the past. In easy times, history is more or less of an ornamental art. But in times of danger, we are driven to the written record by a pressing need to find answers to the riddles of today. We need to know what kind of firm ground other men belonging to generations before us have found to stand on. In spite of changing conditions of life, they were not very different from ourselves. Their thoughts were the grandfathers of our thoughts. They managed to meet situations as difficult as those we have to face and to meet them sometimes lightheartedly, and in some measure to make their hopes prevail. We need to know how they did it. And my, the second paragraph here. In times of change and danger, when there's a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, a sense of continuity with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present and get us past that idiot delusion of the exceptional now that blocks good thinking. That is why in times like ours, when old institutions are caving in and being replaced by new institutions, not necessarily in accord with most men's preconceived hopes, political thought has to look backward as well as forward. <clears throat> as I said, it's from an essay called uh, The Uses of the Past. Uh, he, he's He's arguing that this sense of living connection to the past, which I think is, can be translated as historical consciousness, although he doesn't use the term, is a source of sustenance, even in times of great upheaval. It's a source of, of edification, of insight uh, as well. And that sense can save us from what he calls the idiot delusion <laughs> of the exceptional now. That, and what he means by that is that uh, from the delusion that we live in a time that is so unprecedented, that's so exceptional, that's so uh, completely without any uh, point of reference, of meaningful reference to times in the past, that there's simply no point in studying it. It's, it's completely discontinuous with the world that we inhabit, which I think, I don't know about you, it describes a lot of my students, that the, 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 the view that they can instinctively have, that really, we, we I mean, Gosh, Winston Churchill, you know, I mean, he was pretty cool in his time, but, you know, he didn't, he didn't have an iPhone. I mean, what, 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 <laughs> he, um, uh, I'm ridiculing and I don't, I don't really mean to, they, they can't help it. it. It's up to us to say, uh, to, to insist that there was a world before they came onto the planet. Uh, and, and, uh, and that world has a lot to say about everything that they do, including, uh, the, the, the prosperity and freedom that allows them to own the bloody iPhone in the first place. So, uh, uh, it, it's, it's uh, and we're all prone to think this way, right? I mean, to think our time is so dramatic, so exceptional, so unsettling, uh, that there's um, nothing but the present uh, to use as a point of reference. But does pass us quite probably just brushes this aside as uh, an idiot delusion. Uh, and I, I haven't revealed at this point, but I will reveal now, uh, it, I think it's of some no small interest, when this essay was written. It was written in 1941. You talk about a time when um, everything seemed to be collapsing. You know, Hitler had uh, c control over all of continental Europe, you know, only the British Isles holding out, you know, the United States uh, it, um, held back from participating in the war by uh, fairly stubborn public opinion. You know, it was a very scary time, a scary present. You know, when he was talking about the scary present, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, of course, this is before Pearl Harbor, before, uh, which came to the end of 1941, but uh, it's, a very, it's a much more frightening moment I, I, some of you may disagree with this, but I think it's a much more frightening moment than the present. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
And yet, he is confident that the past is a resource upon which not only you can draw, you must draw. You must be able to draw on that past uh, in, order to, uh, in, in order to find the sustenance to continue to be what, what you are and what you have been. Um, so I've tried to write the book in that spirit. Uh, that uh, in a view of the past that doesn't condescend to it and certainly doesn't refrain from being critical of it, uh, but, but reaches back to it uh, at, at the same time, seeks to recover some of the roots of our story and present it in its fullness, its coarseness, its brutality, its failure, but also its triumphs and grandeur and world historical importance. It's... It also, I think, is important uh, in this, uh, I'm, I'm going to pitch this particular consideration in a leftish direction because I, I think people on the left tend to be a, a little more resistant to this kind of argument about history being a source of national cohesion. We need to take into account the fact that if we don't have a, a sort of cohesive national uh, idea of, of, of our story, of who we are, of our narrative that, that helps to hold us together uh, and, uh, uh, and gives us something, to, a commonality to fall back on. Uh, this reservoir of shared memories that, um, that in certain times, times of crisis, we do suddenly discover we have that, but much of the time we, we act as if we don't. But how can we achieve common goals like health care for all Americans. There's my lefty pitch. But uh, it's actually something everybody wants, but it's particular concern of pe people who are on the left. And uh, how can you do that? How can you persuade American citizens that they need to sacrifice, to give up uh, rations that may be comfortable for them, but not for many, many other people? If there's not a sense of, of a common purpose, of a commonality, and that ultimately is going to be grounded in a story about how we have come this far together. Uh, so uh, I think from all sorts of perspectives, it's something we need. If we, in a diverse society like this one, we, we don't have blood and soil, we don't have uh, sort of lines of uh, ancestry uh, that, uh, that unite us. We don't have racial uh, homogeneity uh, or any, any kind of homogeneity, religious, you name it. We don't have it. <laughs> uh, uh, what do we have to hold us together? Well, we have, we have certain principles, but we also, I think those principles need to be embodied in action, in a story, and an unfolding story. So um, it's, it's a book that also asks at every turn uh, for the, its young readers to reflect on the meaning of history and, and the meaning of the past and to think historically, to think historically about, you know, for example, the issue of slavery uh, and uh, contextually. Uh, I think history is a discipline that should call to the depths of our humanity. Uh, very often, I think most of the time, historians don't do that. But that doesn't mean that it's right not to do that. So... Um, how are we doing? Okay. Let me, I, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the title of the book because I think that also tells you something about what I've tried to do with it. It's Land of Hope. And, um, you know, uh, all the Anglophiles, you know, say, why not Land of Hope and Glory? <laughs> but, um, so I, I but, but uh, titles are not uh, copyrightable, so I, I could do the title I wanted to do. And uh, all along, that's what I felt the book should be called. Even before I wrote a single word, I wanted that title. Um, the book uh, makes an argument, which is a little bit fanciful, but um, I said, you know, we get to be creative around the edges, uh, that all of the Western Hemisphere is settled by people who came from somewhere else. Uh, most of whom, uh, freely, not all, and that is an exception is very important, but uh, people who come from elsewhere, often restless and exploratory, unwilling to settle for the conditions into which they had been born and drawn by the prospect of a new beginning. Nothing is deeper 
in the American soul, the American spirit, than this idea that America represents freedom, it, remembers, it represents a second chance at life, a possibility to pursue ambition in, in a context that is freer, that, that, that the old worlds, whatever old worlds one came from, did not permit. Hope is a word that has both theological and, and secular meanings, material meanings. Uh, um, and all of these meanings, I think, exist and have existed and still exist in abundance in America today. I think nothing in my mind is more uh, definitive of America than this ubiquity of hope. The way that we believe, uh, even those of us who are very cynical, <laughs> that we believe that the way things are initially given to us cannot be the final word about them, that we can never settle for that. Uh, and this is, I think, in a spiritual quality. It's an aspirational quality that I, I, I've taken a vow not to use the word DNA or not the term DNA in reference to culture. I, I, so I just won't do it. But, but if I did, <laughs> I, I would say that this aspirational quality is intrinsic. Uh, it is very deeply um, woven into the fabric of our, of our cultural sensibilities. Um, now, hope and success are not synonymous. Uh, being a land of hope may mean being a land of disappointment, of bitter disappointment, dashed hopes, uh, and uh, a, a nation that sets its goals so high makes itself vulnerable to searing criticism when it falls short of them, as, as it has frequently. You know, viewed in the context of the history of the world, the, 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 the real uh, crime of American slavery was not uh, slavery itself, which has been ubiquitous through most of human history up to the 18th and 19th centuries, but, but the, the um, disharmony, the contradiction, the hypocrisy, uh, uh, the in incompatibility of slavery with professed American ideals. Um, so, but this disharmony is part of the story. It's part of a, uh, it's part of coming to a recognition that um, our heroes are flawed, uh, uh, including the founders, that, that uh, uh, all human beings are flawed. Uh, all human enterprises are flawed. Uh, but in America, this persistence of hope uh, has been, cannot remain defeated for very long. Um, okay, I'm going to conclude with an example of, of the, the book, of, of, of a longer passage in the book, and I'll stop there. But um, <clears throat> this has to do with the end of the Civil War, and uh, it'll give you a sense of my, of my style. Uh, but I also think there's, a, there's an important message in this story about today. Uh, maybe something that we can reach back to. Um, so it's, it's, um, you know, it's April of 1865. Uh, you know, April 9th, after a last flurry of feudal resistance, Lee, General Robert E. Lee, faced facts and arranged to meet Grant at a brick home in the village of Appomattox Courthouse to surrender his army. He could not formally surrender for the whole Confederacy, but... <clears throat> the surrender of his army would trigger the surrender, surrender of all others, and so it represented the end of the Confederate cause. It was a poignant scene, dignified and restrained and sad, as when a terrible storm that has raged and blown has finally exhausted itself, leaving behind a strange and reverent calm, purged of all passion. <coughs> Excuse me. The two men had known one another in the Mexican War, but had not seen one another in nearly 20 years. Lee arrived first wearing his elegant dress uniform, soon to be joined by Grant, clad in a mud-spattered sack coat, his trousers tucked into his muddy boots. Grant always was the fashion plate uh, of the military. <clears throat> 
They showed one another a deep and respectful courtesy. Grant generously allowed Lee's officers to keep their sidearms and the men to keep their horses and take them home for the spring planting. None would be arrested or charged with treason. Four days later, when Lee's army of 28,000 men marched in to surrender their arms and colors, General Joshua L. Chamberlain of Maine, a hero of Gettysburg, was present at the ceremony. He later wrote of his observations that day, reflecting upon the soldierly respect for the men before him, each passing by and stacking his arms, men who only days before had been his mortal foes. And here I quote from Ch uh, Chamberlain. <clears throat> Before us in proud humiliation stood the embodiment of manhood, men whom neither toils or sufferings nor the fact of death nor disaster nor hopelessness could bend from their resolve, standing before us now, thin, worn, and famished, but erect, with eyes looking level into ours, waking memories that bound us together as no other bond. Was not such manhood to be welcomed back into the Union so tested and assured? On our part, not a sound of trumpet more, nor roll of drum, nor a cheer, nor word, nor whisper of vain glory, nor motion of man standing again at the order, but an awed stillness, rather, and breath holding, as if it were the passing of the dead. And that's concludes the excerpt from Chamberlain and now back to me. <clears throat> Such deep sympathies in a victory so heavily tinged with sadness and grief and death. This war was and remains to this day America's bloodiest conflict, having generated at least a million and a half casualties on the two sides combined, including upwards of 800,000 deaths, the equivalent of six million men in today's American population. One in four soldiers who went to war never returned home. One in 13 returned home with one or more missing limbs. For decades to come in every village and town in the land, one could see men bearing such scars and mutilations, a lingering reminder of the price they and others had paid. And yet, Chamberlain's words suggest that there might be room in the days and years ahead for a spirit of conciliation that Lincoln had called for in his second inaugural speech, a spirit of binding up wounds, of caring for the many afflicted and bereaved, and then moving ahead together. It was a slender hope, yet a hope worth holding, worth nurturing, worth pursuing. Well, we all know it didn't turn out that way, <coughs> due in part in large part to Lincoln's violent death at the hands of John Wilkes Booth. But the story, I think, is illustrative nonetheless. If Chamberlain's troops could find it in their hearts to be that forgiving, that generous, that respectful of men who had been only days before been their mortal enemies, we ought to be able to extend a similar generosity towards men from what is now for us a far more distant past. And we can be encouraged in that disposition by Lincoln himself, who said something similar in a cabinet meeting on April 14th, the very day of his assassination, and I read this. I hope there will be no persecution, no bloody work after the war is over. Enough lives have been sacrificed. We must extinguish our resentment if we expect harmony and union. There has been too much of a desire on the part of some of our very good friends to be masters, to interfere with and dictate to those states, to treat the people not as fellow citizens. There is too little respect for their rights, and I do not sympathize with these feelings. <clears throat> Again, we, we, we have, can only wonder what would have happened if Lincoln had, uh, and had lived and Reconstruction had been presided over by him. Um, quite possible that he would have made too many concessions to the defeated South, um, as his successor did. Um, we can never know for certain, but given the high regard in which Lincoln is rightly held by most Americans, it would be a mistake not to pay attention to his example, not only in understanding the past in which he lived, but the present in which we live as well. Lincoln never lost sight of the fact that the war that consumed his presidency and finally his life would be a failure 
if it were not, in the end, a war of reunification and reconciliation and not merely a war of conquest and vengeance. We will fare better in our own debates and internal conflicts that we can remember the same thing. Thank you. Thank you.